The party broke up after supper about quarter past twelve. Seeing her visitors off, Olga Mikhailovna stood at the door and said, You really ought to take a show. It's turning a little chilly. Please, God, you don't catch cold. Don't trouble, Olga Mikhailovna, ladies answered as they got in the carriage. Well, goodbye. Mind now, we're expecting you. Don't play us false. Oh, the coachman checked the horses. Ready, Dennis? Goodbye, Olga. Kiss the children for me. The carriage started and immediately disappeared into the darkness. In the red circle of light cast by the lamp in the road, fresh pair of trio of impatient horses and the silhouette of a coachman with his hands held out stiffly before him would come into view. Again there began kisses, reproaches and entreaties to come again or to take a show. Pyotr Dmitrich kept running out and helping the ladies into their carriages. You go now by Ifremovna, he directed the coachman. It's nearer through Mankino, but the road is worse that way. You might have an upset. Goodbye, Makcharma. Mere compliments to your artist. Goodbye, Olga Mikhailovna, darling. Go indoors, or you will catch cold. It's damp. Oh, you rascal. What horses have you got here? Pyotr Dmitrich asked. They were bought from Hyderov in Lent, answered the coachman. Capital horses. And Pyotr Dmitrich patted the trace horse on the haunch. Well, you can start. God give you good luck. The last visitor was gone. The last red circle on the road quivered, moved aside, contracted and went out, as Vasily carried away the lamp from the entrance. On previous occasions, when they had seen off their visitors, Pyotr Dmitrich and Olga Mikhailovna had begun dancing about the drawing room, facing each other, clapping their hands and singing, They've gone, they've gone, but now Olga Mikhailovna was not equal to that. She went to her bedroom, undressed and got into bed. She fancied she would fall asleep at once and sleep soundly. Her legs and her shoulders ached painfully. Her head was heavy from the strain of talking, and she was conscious, as before, of discomfort all over her body. Covering her head over, she lay still for three or four minutes, then peeped out from under the bedclothes at the lamp before the icon listened to the silence and smiled. "'It's nice,' she whispered. "'It's nice,' curling up her legs, which felt as they had grown longer from so much walking. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Her legs would not get into a comfortable position. She felt uneasy all over, and she turned on the other side. Big fly blew buzzing about the bedroom and thumped again the ceiling. She could hear, too, Grigory and Vasily stepping cautiously about the drawing room, putting the chairs back in their places. It seemed to Olga Mikhailovna that she could not go to sleep nor be comfortable till those sounds were hushed. And again she turned over on the other side impatiently. She heard her husband's voice in the drawing room. Someone must be staying the night, as Pyotr Dmitrich was addressing someone and speaking loudly. I don't say that Count Alexei Petrovich is an impostor, but he can't help seeming to be one, because all of you gentlemen attempt to see in him something different from what he really is. His craziness is looked upon as originality, his familiar manners as good nature, and his complete absence of opinions as conservatism. Even granted that he is a conservative of the stamp of 84, what after all is conservatism? Pyotr Dmitrich, angry with Count Alexei Petrovich, his visitors and himself, was relieving his heart. He abused both the Count and his visitors, and in his vexation with himself was ready to speak out and to hold forth upon anything. After seeing his guest to his room, he walked up and down the drawing room, walked through the dining room, down the corridor, then into his study, then again went into the drawing room and came into the bedroom. Olga Mikhailovna was lying on her back with the bedclothes only to her waist, but now she felt hot, and with an angry face watched the fly that was thumping against the ceiling. Is someone staying the night? she asked. Igorov. Pyotr Dmitrich undressed and got into his bed. Without speaking, he lighted a cigarette, and he too fell to watching the fly. There was an uneasy and forbidden look in his eyes. Olga Mikhailovna looked at his handsome profile for five minutes in silence. It seemed to her for some reason that if her husband were suddenly to turn facing her and to say, Olga, I'm unhappy, she would cry or laugh and she would be at ease. She fancied that her legs were aching and her body was uncomfortable all over because of the strain on her feelings. Pyotr, what are you thinking of? she said. Nothing, her husband answered. You've taken to having secrets from me of late. That's not right. Why is it not right? answered Pyotr Dmitrich dryly and not at once. We all have our personal life, every one of us, and we are bound to have our secrets. 
Personal life, our secrets that solve wars, understand your wounding me, said Olga Mikhailovna sitting up in bed. If you have a load on your heart, why do you hide it from me? Why do you find it more suitable to open your heart to women who are nothing to you instead of to your wife? I overheard your outpourings to Lubochka by the bee house today. Well, I congratulate you. I'm glad you did overhear it. This meant, leave me alone and let me think. Olga Mikhailovna was indignant. Vexation, hatred and wrath, which had been accumulating within her during the whole day, suddenly boiled over. She wanted at once to speak out, to hurt her husband without putting it off till tomorrow, to wound him, to punish him. Making an effort to control herself and not to scream, she said, Let me tell you then that it's all loathsome. I've been hating you all day. You see what you've done? Piotr Dmitrievich too got up and sat on the bed. It's loathsome, Olga Mikhailovna went on, beginning to tremble all over. There's no need to congratulate me. You had better congratulate yourself. It's a shame, a disgrace. You wrapped yourself in lies till you're ashamed to be alone in the room with your wife. You're a deceitful man. I see through you, understand every step you take. Olga, I wish you would please warn me when you are out of humor, then I will sleep in the study. Saying this, Pyotr Dmitrich picked up his pillow and walked out of the bedroom. Olga Mikhailovna had not foreseen this. For some minutes she remained silent with her mouth open, trembling all over and looking at the door by which her husband had gone out, trying to understand what it meant. Was this one of the devices to which deceitful people have recourse when they are in the wrong? Was it the deliberate insult aimed at her pride? How was she to take it? Olga Mikhailovna remembered her cousin, a lively young officer, who often used to tell her laughing that when his spouse nagged at him at night, he usually picked up his pillow and went whistling to spend the night in his study, leaving his wife in a foolish and ridiculous position. This officer was married to a rich capricious, a foolish woman whom he did not respect but simply put up with. Olga Mikhailovna jumped out of bed. To her mind there was only one thing left for her to do now, to dress with all possible haste and to leave the house forever. The house was her own, but so much the worse for Pyotr Dmitrich. Without pausing to consider whether this was necessary or not, she went quickly to the study to inform her husband of her intention. Feminine logic flashed through her mind, and to say something wounding and sarcastic at parting. Pyotr Dmitrich was lying on the sofa and pretending to read the newspaper. There was a candle burning on a chair near him. His face could not be seen behind the newspaper. Be so kind as to tell me what this means, I'm asking you. Be so kind, Pyotr Dmitrich mimicked her, not showing his face. It's sickening, Olga. Upon my honor, I'm exhausted and not up to it. Let us do our quarreling tomorrow. No, I understand it perfectly, Olga Mikhailovna went on. You hate me. Yes, you hate me because I'm richer than you. You will never forgive me for that, and will always be lying to me. Feminine logic flashed through her mind again. You're laughing at me now. I'm convinced, in fact, that you only married me in order to have property qualifications, and those wretched whores are miserable. Pyotr Dmitrich dropped the newspaper and got up. The unexpected insult overwhelmed him. With a childishly helpless smile, he looked desperately at his wife, and holding out his hands to her as though to ward off blows, he said imploringly, Olga! and expecting her to say something else awful, he leaned back in his chair, and his huge figure seemed as helplessly childish as he smiled. How could you say it? he whispered. Olga Mikhailovna came to herself. She was suddenly aware of her passionate love for this man, remembered that he was her husband, without whom she could not live for a day, and who loved her passionately too. She burst into loud sobs that sounded strange and unlike her, and ran back to her bedroom. She fell on the bed and short hysterical sobs choking her and making her arms and legs twitch filled the bedroom. Remembering there was a visitor sleeping three or four rooms away, she buried her head under the pillow to stifle her sobs, but the pillow rolled down to the floor and she almost fell on the floor herself when she stopped to pick it up. She pulled the quilt up to her face, but her hands would not obey her but tore convulsively at everything she clutched. She thought that everything was lost, that the falsehood she had told to wound her husband had shattered her life into fragments. Her husband would not forgive her. The insult she had hurled at him was not one that could be effaced by any caresses, by any vows. How could she convince her husband that she didn't believe what she had said? It's all over, she cried, not noticing a pillow had slipped onto the floor again. For God's sake, it's all over. Probably roused by her cries, the guests and the servants were now awake. 
Next day all neighborhood would know that she had been in hysterics and would blame Pyotr Dmitrich. She made an effort to restrain herself, but her sobs grew louder and louder every minute. For God's sake, she cried in a voice not like her own, not knowing why she cried it. She felt as though the bed were heaving under her and her feet were entangled in the bedcloth. Pyotr Dmitrich in his dressing gown with the candle in his hand came into the bedroom. Olga, hush, he said. She raised herself, and kneeling up in bed, screwing up her eyes at the light, articulated through her sobs. Understand? She wanted to tell him that she was tired to death by the party, by her falsity, by her own falsity, that it had all worked together, but she could only articulate, understand? Come, drink, he said, handing her some water. She took the glass obediently and began drinking, but the water splashed over and was split on her arms, her throat and knees. I must look horribly unseemly, she thought. Pyotr Dmitrich put her back in bed without a word and covered her with quilt. Then he took the candle and went out. For God's sake, Olga Mikhailovna cried again. Pyotr, understand. Suddenly something gripped her in the lower part of her body and back with such violence that her wailing was cut short and she beat the pillow from the pain, but the pain let her go again at once and she began sobbing again. Maid came in and arranged a quilt over her, asked in alarm, Mistress, darling, what is the matter? Go out of the room, said Pyotr Dmitrich, sternly, going up to the bed. Understand, understand, Olga Mikhailovna began. Well, I entreat you, calm yourself, he said. I didn't mean to hurt you. I would not have gone out of the room if I had known it would have hurt you so much. Simply felt depressed, tell you on my honor. Understand, you were lying, I was lying. I understand. Come on, that's enough, I understand, said Pyotr Dmitrich tenderly, sitting down on her bed. You said that in anger, I quite understand. I swear to God I love you beyond anything on earth, and when I married you I never once thought of you being rich. I loved you immensely, and that's all, I assure you. I've never been in want of money or felt the value of it, and so cannot feel the difference between your fortune and mine. It always seemed to me we were equally well off, and that I have been deceitful and little think that, of course, is true. My life has his hair to be arranged in such a frivolous way that it has somehow been impossible to get on the paltry line. It weighs on me, too, now. Let's leave off talking about it, for goodness sake. Olga Mikhailovna again felt in acute pain and clutched her husband by the sleeve. I'm in pain. In pain, she said rapidly. What pain? Damnation takes those visitors, muttered Pyotr Dmitrich, getting up. You ought not to have gone to the island today, he cried. What an idiot I was not to prevent you, my God. He scratched his head in vexation and with a wave of his hand walked out of the room. Then he came into the room several times, sat down on the bed beside her and talked a great deal, sometimes tenderly, sometimes angrily, but she hardly heard him. Her sobs were continually interrupted by a fearful attack of pain, and each time the pain was more acute and prolonged. At first she held her breath and beat the pillow during the pain, but then she began screaming on an unseemly piercing note. Once seeing her husband near her, she remembered that she had insulted him, and without pausing to think whether it were really Pyotr Dmitrich or whether she were in delirium, clutched his hand in both hers and began kissing him. You were lying, I was lying, she began justifying herself. Understand, they have exhausted me, driven me out of all patience. Olga, we are not alone, said Pyotr Dmitrich. Olga Mikhailovna raised her head and saw Arvara, who was kneeling by the chest of drawers and pulling out the bottom drawer. The top drawers were already open. The Varvara got up, read from the strained position, and with a cold, solemn face began trying to unlock a box. Maria, I can't unlock it, she said in a whisper. You unlock it, won't you? Maria, the maid, was digging the candle end out of the candlestick with a pair of scissors so as to put in a new candle. She went up to Barbara and helped her to unlock the box. There should be nothing locked, whispered Barbara. Unlock this basket too, my good girl. Master, she said, you should send to Father Michael to unlock the holy gates. You must. Do what you like, said Pyotr Dmitrich, breathing hard. Only for God's sake, make haste and fetch the doctor or the midwife. Has Vasily gone? Send someone else. Send your husband. It's the birth, Olga Mikhailovna thought. Varvara, she moaned, but he won't be born alive. It's all right, mistress, whispered Varvara. Please, God, he will be alive. 
When Olga Mihalovna came to herself again after a pain, she was no longer sobbing nor tossing from side to side, but moaning. She could not refrain from moaning even in the intervals between the pains. The candles were still burning, but the morning light was coming through the blinds. It was probably about five o'clock in the morning. At the round table there was sitting some unknown woman with a very discreet air, wearing a white apron. From her whole appearance it was evident she had been sitting there a long time. Olga Mikhailovna guessed that she was the midwife. Will it soon be over? she asked, and in her voice she heard peculiar and familiar note which had never been there before. It must be dying in childbirth, she thought. Pyotr Dmitrich came cautiously into the bedroom dressed for the day and stood at the window with his back to his wife. He lifted the blind and looked out of the window. What rain, he said. What time is it? asked Olga Mikhailovna in order to hear the unfamiliar note in her voice again. Quarter to six, answered the midwife. What if I really am dying? thought Olga Mikhailovna, looking at her husband's head and the window panes on which the rain was beaten. How will he live without me? With whom will he have tea and dinner talk in the evening? Sleep? And he seemed to her like a forlorn child. She felt sorry for him and wanted to say something nice, caressing and consolatory. She remembered how in the spring he had meant to buy himself some harriers, and she, thinking it a cruel and dangerous sport, had prevented him from doing it. Pyotr, buy yourself harriers, she mourned. He dropped the blind, went up to the bed, and would have said something, but at that moment the pain came back, and Olga Mikhailovna uttered an unseemly piercing scream. The pain and the constant screaming and moaning stupefied her. She heard, saw, and sometimes spoke, but hardly understood anything, and was only conscious that she was in pain, or was just going to be in pain. It seemed to her that the name day party had been long, long ago, not yesterday, but a year ago perhaps, and that her new life of agony had lasted longer than her childhood, her school days, her time at the university and her marriage, and would go on for a long, long time endlessly. She saw them bring tea to the midwife and summon her at midday to lunch and afterwards to dinner. She saw Piotr Dmitrich grow used to coming in, standing for long intervals by the window and going out again, so strange men, the maid, Varvara, come in as though they were at home. Varvara said nothing but he will, he will, and was angry when anyone closed the drawers and the chest. Olga Mikhailovna saw the light change in the room and in the windows. At one time it was twilight, then thick like fog, then bright daylight as it had been at dinner time the day before, then again twilight, and each of these changes lasted as long as her childhood, her school days, her life at the university. In the evening, two doctors, one bony bald with a big red beard, the other with a swarthy Jewish face and cheap spectacles, performed some sort of operation on Olga Mikhailovna. To this unknown man touching her body, she felt utterly indifferent, but now she had no feeling of shame, no will, and anyone might do what he would with her. If anyone had rushed at her with a knife or had insulted Pyotr Dmitrich or had robbed her of her right to the little creature, she would not have said a word. They gave her chloroform during the operation. When she came to again, the pain was still there and insufferable. It was night, and Olga Mikhailovna remembered that there had been just such a night with the stillness. The lamp, the midwife sitting motionless by the bed with the drawers of the chest pulled out, with Pyotr Dmitrich standing by the widow, but sometime very, very long time ago.